shortly after getting into this new science was that it really gave you a new story of, of everything. Though in the end, it all became very common sense. Um, so, you have a new vi vision of what God, I mean, for me, I, mean, I started out, I started out as a UCC, United Church of Christ, but I got, my confirmation was with a guy from Germany who was just very authoritarian, and I decided I didn't believe any of the, the actual dogma that went along with um, the church at that time. So I became sort of like a floating agnostic. I really didn't know if there was or there wasn't, and I didn't think about it very much. Um, but then getting into this kind of stuff, I now actually believe God is a physically real thing. Which we will see why I believe that in, <laughs> in a little bit. But anyway, I now see God as a universal force, a universal physical force that created and still guides all things. In this new science, mind and body are completely natural and integrated and co-evolving, and that includes your societal mind. So that it's not just your body and your brain, it's our culture and our economic systems and our social structures. Humanity, as I've said before, is a collaborative learning species that thrives on distributed intelligent empowerment and commitment. So if you look at how the human body works, the human body works on this thing called subsidiarity, which means that no, you, you are made of a bunch of intelligent cells all distributed throughout your body. And decisions are made at the lowest level possible in that system. That's why your mind can kind of like spin off into space while uh, your body's doing whatever. Okay? So that's. Keep breathing. Yeah, you keep on breathing. <laughs> and, you, and most of the times your brain does, has no idea how you're doing lots of things, especially in sports. Anyway. Um, so, hierarchy is a guardian power system, not oligarchic hegemony. This is really one of the more important things. Um, corporations as employee-owned, community-serving, quality-creating, contribution-hardening, <coughs> cooperatives. Actually, somebody was asking if it's possible to have a good hierarchy or good corporation. And there's, Yes Magazine has this wonderful new ar uh, article exactly about that, which talks about the problem with corporations is it's the underlying culture and that the laws that force them uh, it to be a certain way. But that when you get into employee-owned corporations, a lot of the problems that you see currently with corporations essentially go away. Okay. Justice, joy, and integrity is essential to uh, socioeconomic health and a rig rigorous physical science that validates all of these things. When I mess around with this stuff, I think that this leads to the single greatest integration of our time, which is realizing that love, intelligence, power, and spirit are all together and they have to, I mean, all of those things are necessary in our world. And getting them to fit together and work together right is crucial, right? We're having, as a society, we have terrible problems with this right now. Um, spirit and intelli uh, intelligence, so as a result of the medieval modern uh, transition, religion and science sort of have this antithetical relationship with each other. Um, a lot of the New Age spirituality people will also have sort of a, a kind of a love-hate relationship with, with serious kind of rigorous science and certainly with power. So. Unfortunately, power is absolutely necessary in groups beyond a certain size. So figuring out how these things fit together, because they're all absolutely real-world phenomena, is the most important integration of our time. It is. So, first question is, where does all this order come from? Anybody want to make a guess? Energy flow. Good, that's going to be the next slide. Hold on to that thought. <laughs> okay, well, hit, hit the slide. We'll go, we'll go with it. All right, so about 15 years ago, these two French scientists did this interesting little uh, experiment. So imagine this is, this is a disc with a little film, a thin film of, of fluid, and these are little magnetized drops. And there are magnets on, this is a circular thing, so... There are magnets on either side that will pull or attracting these little uh, dot, uh, dots apart, little droplets apart, and they repel each other. So the, these repel each other and they're all being drawn this way. And depending upon how fast you drop it, 
You drop one down, and it, if it's too close to the, to the last one, it'll just sort of jostle it, and they'll arrange in this little pattern. And as you drop more, then they'll jostle each other more and make this other pattern. You do that enough, and what you end up with is this. Okay? And that turns out to be exactly the same sacred geometry stuff that you saw all the way throughout here. So the simple upshot of this is, forget this concept of nonlinear dynamics, it's really web dynamics. We live in a comprehensively interwoven fabric of attractive and repulsive forces, if you want to talk as a physicist. But essentially, we're all constantly being jostled, just like that. Attractive and repulsive forces everywhere in all things. And this creates a kind of a weird invisible hand that turns out to produce all the order at every level in the cosmos. So, this is your answer. What connects and makes all things move, grow, and develop, and evolve? So, proton cycle, this is actually proton, proton. This is the, uh, the fusion and uh, fission cycle on, on stars that cause them to produce that in intense energy. We all know what the Krebs cycle is inside your body. Living cells, water cycle, plate tectonics, I could have added ecosystems. What do these all have in common? Bloop. Yes, they're energy flow systems. <laughs> I mean, the only reason you walk is because you've got a metabolism, and metabolism is another word for converting food into energy. Okay? The whole cosmos works on the same basic principle. It's all circulating energy. That's why organization exists. That's why they, they emerge. That's why they grow. That's why they develop. Can I ask you a quick question? Sure. Do we have any idea why the energy flows in the particular way and patterns that That's it does? The web dynamics. That's the weird thing is that the energy creates a pressure to flow. But this fact that we are all kind of like, it's like being, like we all have little rubber bands around us, right? And you pull this way in your rubber band and then it'll snap you back that way. That turns out to be relatively literally true. So, so they used to call it nonlinear dynamics, which is what does nonlinear dynamics mean? And the famous inside the field, they say, well, the joke was, calling chaos theory nonlinear dynamics is like calling zoology the study of not elephant animals. <laughs> <laughs> yes, nonlinearity is such a misnomer. It's about the pattern in pulls and pushes of interdependent forces. The fact that we really aren't separate, we aren't disconnected, we aren't billion points. Okay, so good If you get into all of this, and you've got to remember, this order goes all the way down, and we're talking about subatomic decay has the same patterns, cosmic forces have the same patterns, spirals, I didn't throw it up here, but if you look at the growth of primitive villages, they too follow the same energy and dynamics. We were talking earlier about the fractal city, that people have looked at the spatial geometries of what makes an effective city, and so, so you can have conversations and you can have good tr uh, transportation and all these kinds of things that you need for a healthy whole. Turns out, it's all part, if you, you have to follow natural patterns in order to get it. So, if you put all this stuff together, what you get is a picture, a picture of a great ordering oneness. Right? This is a term from Plato, right? From my, <laughs> yes, so we, we're all a matter of who, <laughs> who created us and, and it's still guiding us anyway. <laughs> what you get is a physical understanding of God and the perennial philosophy. So you can say, as a physicist, we live in an omnipresent creative force that gave rise to and still guides all things. It's an all-embracing unity which, in which the one is many and the many are one. You could toss in the as above, so below thing. It's an invisible hand that weaves exquisite order into every fi fiber of being. It's a cosmos striving towards ever-increasing intricacy and intelligence. And it's an ecological universe in which balance and harmony are the best way to survive. When you get down into the, the early esoteric versions of every great religion, not only they do all of these kinds of things, but they will actually talk about us. So, I don't know if we should bring this in. <laughs> anyway. Um, Aldous Huxley wrote a, uh, uh, a little article on the perennial philosophy that gave out four different points. And one of them said that the 
the purpose of human uh, life on Earth was unitive knowledge of the Godhead. So basically, we're struggling and trying to find meaning in this world, all working our way to a closer harmony with and understanding of the great ordering oneness. So if you want to talk about how do you get the society to work better, you have to learn how to work in balance and harmony with essentially the physical forces of this incredible ordering system that we live in. Okay. Now in this system, the main path of evolution is specialize and collaborate. Okay, so anybody here heard of Lynn Margulis, a uh, Boston University biologist? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Famous for serial endosymbiosis. <laughs> anyway, this is the basic so story of what she does. Okay, so imagine you're on early Earth and, and you've got algae. And it's, it's got the sun coming down and it's got the water and the nutrients coming up and it's just multiplying like mad. It's happy. Unfortunately, it starts piling up on top of each other. And as it does, the guys on the top don't have access to the water and the nutrients, and the guys on the bottom don't have access to the sun. So large numbers of them start dying out. Until some clever two cells decide this guy passes the water and nutrients up, this guy passes the results of photosynthesis down, and they become a committed collaboration. They become specialists who collaborate and together they survive better than they could independently. Is that like a tree? The roots pass the water up and the leaves pass the Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Didn't hear that. He said, is that like a tree with the roots pass the water up and... The, right. the yeah. leaves and branches pass the sun and carbon and dioxide, dioxide down, right? down. So it turns out that this is a fairly universal thing. So if you read Margulis, you look, this is a eukaryotic cell, the one with mitochondria and a nucleus and all those kind of sophisticated. So this is a relatively sophisticated uh, cell. And they find out that the DNA in some of those cell organelles is different. So the DNA of the mitochondria is different from the DNA of the nucleus. <clears throat> the heck is that all about? Well, it turns out that they believe at this point that the nucleus came from one earlier prokaryotic bacteria. Spirochetes became the flagella, and the respiring bacteria became the mitochondria. Okay? So that what we see as a unitary cell is actually a, co a cooperative, with specialists doing different things. And they've been doing it together so long that they now reproduce as a whole. Fascinating. Yeah, go ahead. Um, is there a place for competition in this uh, specializing and collaborative uh, yes, process? Yes, competition. Yeah, because um, <coughs> specialists do their thing better than other people do their thing, uh, other, other cells do their thing, so that there was an initial competition <coughs> and the ones that do the best in a certain area, absolutely. So, yes, it's not that it's all lovey-dovey type of cooperation, it's just not destructive. They're not mutually destructive because it turns out that if the best way to survive long term is to specialize and integrate, not to wipe each other out. We'll get to why we wipe each other out. Yeah, that, we, we need to address that issue. I, I, I have a slide for you later on. <laughs> okay, hit the next one. Okay, so here's the other nice thing about energy. Energy gives you a physical basis of information. Okay, so imagine I'm a little photon of light, little energy packet, right? And I'm in the beginning, I'm one of these primordial cells, and I'm, you know, I have no intelligence. You know, I'm just going. Boom, boom, boom. But if I happen to swallow that little photon of light, it happens to bump into me. First of all, it will energize me. It quite likely will make me move because it's it's a little packet of energy. If it happens to make me move in the direction of food, I've suddenly done something functional to allow myself to live longer than just my immediate energy source. So there are biologists, um, two Chilean <coughs> ones in particular, um, Maturana and Varela, who say that the real trick to life is not replication because you actually get just non-living chemical systems that replicate. The real trick is that if you take something like boiling water, you turn off its heat and it goes, right? 
If you take those early bacteria, if you take away their sun, they go. If you take away the energy source of most sophisticated living organisms or cells of any kind, it doesn't go. It goes and finds food. Okay? That probably happened as a natural physical phenomenon of functional, accidental, of course, but functional response to incoming energy trails. A little photon of light here, a little chemical gradient, which we would call smell someplace else. Okay? It's not natural, it's physical, and what you find is that if this is the case, then natural selection works like with a vengeance on everything that combines informa incoming information with functional response, because that's how you survive. Well, who are the authors you quoted? Um, Umberto Maturana, M-A-T-U-R-A-N-A, -A -A. they have a wonderful book called The Tree of Life, it's kind of old now, but, and Francisco Varela, V-A-R-E-L-A. Um, okay. You will also notice that mind, as this functional, this intelligence, this functional response to incoming information, and body, all of the little parts of the cell that actually respond to it, are completely integrated and have been since the very beginning of information. Hit the next one. Okay. Sally, could you just go back a second? You said accidental, of course. So when does accidental become intentional? We're getting there. <laughs> okay. okay. Now remember, these cells are really little collaborations. And as you start, you start first you start a single cell and it's fine, but as you get that cell starts multiplying, you'll get lots of different specialist cells. Now in the beginning, if, if you're very small, you're actually in physical context. So if you have to like pass something off to somebody else or communicate something, you just osmose something. A little electrical uh, current over here, a little chemical gradient there. Your multi, uh, multicellulars can stay cooperatively coherent and functional just because they're close in proximity. But as they start getting bigger and bigger, they literally grow apart. So you will find that the first nerve cell was, I think, 500 million years ago in the giant, giant was it sea slum? I forget what it was. No. Uh, anyway, I'm squid. It was mm -hmm. before the squid. My, my memory's gone. But anyway, but um, essentially what happens is that as these multicellulars start growing apart, the specialists have to stay in sync. Otherwise, they, they are now so committed to this collaboration they'll die. Um, so, I actually give the story of the. Uh, of the caveman. If I'm a caveman and I'm chasing my, a rabbit for dinner and my running along like this, my lungs have to start breathing faster so I get more oxygen to keep the muscle cells going because if I don't, they're going to build up lactic acid and they're going to stop and they're going to go dead. In order to do that, therefore, you have to have a lot of communication between your legs and your lungs. Come on, other things, all right? If your legs and your lungs stop communicating because they don't have any way to do it, then I run and I run and I run, and my lactic acid builds up and I fall on the ground and I die. So all the cavemen who don't have really good internal communication die. Right? So what happens is that as, as you get bigger and bigger, you have to invent something that moves signals back and forth, eventually moves materials back and forth. So first you invent a nerve cell, then it gets bigger and bigger, you get many nerve cells, you get bigger and bigger, you get a brain system with a nervous system, a brain with a nervous system. The difference about a brain is now the brain is sitting on top of all these nerve cells and it's watching for patterns in large numbers of signals going back and forth so it becomes a pattern recognition system. Okay? Different view of how evolution... So it's the initial accident of responding functionally to information turns out then to be essential to keeping intelligence growing and evolving and communicate, communicating inside as well as outside. Similar kinds of uh, uh, pressures, growth pressures, are noted in um, humans. So we start out a million years ago as Australopithecus, and we're in these little loose family pods, and they're essentially foraging, and again, 
no problem communicating because you're in constant daily contact. You get slightly bigger, you now have multi-families, uh, um, you now ha have a harder time, you actually invent a new, uh, way, a new economy, so now you're hunting and gathering. You're much more coordinated, you'll have a, a head man, you'll have uh, people who are specializing in beating the bushes while somebody else is throwing rocks down on the, on the beast, or somebody's a great spearman, somebody's good at making baskets. You'll start getting that whole specialize and integrate, really, and cooperate. You get bigger still, you eventually have the uh, agricultural revolution, and you start getting much more sophisticated, more intricate, internal coordination and, and structure, basically, infrastructures. You get clans, and you get councils, and you get, um, you know, relationships between the mother and the uncle and the kid, and, you know, it becomes all very exotic and, and sophisticated, all those ways to keep people in coordinated and communicated and communication. There's an interesting thing about these villages, <coughs> again, with people find, have researched everything, they find that when they reach about 350 people, they can no longer stay in really good uh, contact. So that's when you start seeing the invention of two different things. One is money, symbolic tokens that you can say, so I borrowed your chicken here, give me, or took your chicken, but here's a thing, and you can go to my brother-in-law, and he will give you two days labor or whatever it is. So that money helps people stay, helps things circulate, helps... Uh, people stay in contact. And the other one is myths. So they started not only talking, but they started developing these stories that had some memory to them, so that you start getting quite a lot of sophisticated things that help this increasingly large and diverse group still feel like a whole. Okay? You get bigger still, we'll eventually, I'm going to explain why we get hierarchical civilization in a minute, but beyond a certain size, you absolutely need some form of hierarchy. Now, one of the stories about how it probably happened was that you had these nice, rich farming villages sitting around, but you also probably still had some hunting bands uh, running around. But once these get pretty large, they're very unruly, and people can't act together for a focused cause. So they become right picking for these marauding bands. So eventually what happens is you develop a hierarchy, one guy making decisions, working with a set of warriors who can mobilize really fast, and you set up a system of defense, and that evolves eventually into a, essentially a command and control um, uh, system. Because what hierarchies do is they are way more efficient when it comes to taking action as a collective. Okay. The problem today is that we have reached the level of complexity and the pace of change is so fast that Command and control no longer works, and it hasn't worked for probably a good 30 years. So, you know, if you have to wait for information to go all the way up and come all the way back down, you're hosed. You know, so if you look at the military nowadays, they have a big emphasis on making local decisions and taking actions. They'll have a big umbrella understanding, but they have to be able to do a lot of auto autonomous action. Okay, so. The idea is that we are now reaching the limits of command and control hierarchy civilization, and we're moving into this next stage of global network civilization. And we won't talk about exactly what that will be just yet, so we'll get the next one. Now, I was talking with Steve just before we started about the fact that stages of consciousness that co-evolve with major stages of economics and social organization. Now, this is the work of people like Claire um, Graves and Don Beck. This is Spiral Dynamics. I like this one better. It's called The Radiance of Being by Alan Combs. Um, this one is actually Gene Gebser's theory of the uh, evolution of consciousness, which is what I'm doing here. So, bear with me. If we imagine a million years ago, we were in these loose foraging pots, and we basically looked for bananas and roots and berries, and that's what we ate. Okay? Um, the stage of consciousness they imagined was essentially very much like what an animal would be. It's you're basically 
in the moment, in reality, you're in a timeless immersion in reality. You're not thinking about what's going to happen in the future. You will have emotional reactions to the immediacy, the, the fear and the love and those kinds of things, but not much more than that. Okay. Some and please bear with me, the dates are incredibly debatable and you can get everybody from 150 BC to 50 BC, I decided to take the more conservative date, that we start doing the hunter-gatherer. We start making tools, okay? We have the spears and we, you know, you know, we have tools, <laughs> the Neolithic tools. We also start doing symbols and that's noticed in the cave painting and we're very focused on kinship bonds. So they take um, very primitive tribes that are still doing these kinds of magical cave paintings and this kind of stuff. They find that the individuals, particularly these are pygmy tribes that are still doing a lot of this stuff, see the painted hunt and the real hunt as equally real. So there's not a lot of differentiation between the real and the, and the symbolic. So that... <laughs> They are taking that, their spears and attacking these uh, cave animals because it's, they're in that, for them, there is no separation, it's real. Okay, fast forward. By 10,000 BC, we've had the agricultural re uh, revolution. We're in partnership villages. How many people have heard of Rianne Eisler and the Chalice of the Blade? This is also a wonderful book. Um, but it'll talk about the idea that the mode of operation in these partnership um, villages was pretty much what I think we'd all like to see it become in, in the future, which is pretty egalitarian. Um, <laughs> the focus was on, on having a healthy whole so that you were, um, the, owns, the means of production were owned in common and uh, people, everybody had a fair share and, and as long as you worked, they kept took care of the elderly, and, and they were, anyway, seems pretty nice in many ways. Um, this is called the mythic stage of consciousness because this is the origins of the first um, myths, and they talk about the beginning of time, because um, myths always start about in some faraway time, in some faraway place, which we're not exactly sure how long ago that was, but sometime in the past, things happened, and it's very oriented around community. Okay, and then around 3000 BC, we invented coercive hierarchies, and our mainstay economy was empire building. Okay, you will find honest historians who will say that civilization is based on war, and they will say things like that because the great cities started because that's where you could get the artisans to come pound iron into uh, swords, and that would attract. Um, people to come in and the, and the, and the uh, kings would have money because they would go out and raid and they would, the soldiers would come in to be paid and so we got this wonderful system of, of in industry, the, the first military industrial complex actually. Um, so that started around 3000 BC, frequently attributed to Sumeria. Yeah. Shouldn't we also talk about the intensification of agriculture that permitted empire building? Well, yes, yeah, in this kind of a view of things, each one rests on the previous. That is, if you didn't have the agricultural revolution, you wouldn't be able to have the, uh, the empire Part of the empire command building. and control and empire building that allowed it to happen was, was um, about how to manage the agriculture. For example, irrigation systems. Absolutely, and, and land. So let's, as long as we're going there, let's... Okay, one moment. <laughs> um, economy is empire building. It's also called the mental stage of con uh, consciousness because this is the first individuation. If you look, ever heard of Julian James and the origins of consciousness and the breakdown of the bicameral mind? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Another great book. <laughs> you guys are so well educated. Um, they're talking about in this mythic stage, there was very little individuation from community. And this lasted actually even as late as the Middle Ages. It was worse to be exiled than it was to be killed. So if you got a choice, you would rather be have your head chopped off than be forced to leave the community. So individuation and a sense of separate identity became a, was a big deal. And so you, and 
the people who study the evolution of consciousness talk about by Rome, there was this emphasis on mirrors, so you could look at yourself in the face, and they um, <laughs> admire. And Rome also started went from the Greek universal beauty to the craggy face of each individual emperor. Kind of thing. So, for the last five thousand years, we've had increasing individuation, increasing emphasis on the alpha males in particular. Um, so, it's individuation and power, and also reason. Take the next one. Okay, so this is my. This is actually from Robert Carnero, who's a American anthropologist, um, writing mostly in the 60s and 70s. Um, but then you have this question of if you look at when if you look at how it's in the history of the U.S. Columbus sails over and meets all of these healthy, straight teeth, strong limbed hunter-gatherer, agrarian types. Um, and then <laughs> the fine Europeans come in and they spread disease and, and greed and all sorts of other horrible, nasty things and essentially wipe them out. So if you imagine that before we invented coercive hierarchies, we were probably all in that relatively agrarian, relatively happy, relatively stable community kinds of thing, why the heck did we change? Or is my friend, a naval historian, Robert Argigiani, says, why did our ancestors leave the garden for societies that were coercive, militaristic, and exploitative? Mm -hmm. Okay, this is Robert Carnero's answer. So he looks at, if you look at all hierarchical civilizations start in a constrained region of very fertile land, the Tigris, Tigris and Euphrates, the Huang Ho, the Indus River Valleys, the mountainous valleys of Peru, okay? What happens in those is you probably start with these little tribes that have a little plot of land. They're probably not much like the, uh, the Indians of uh, Virginia when Columbus sailed over. And as long as there's plenty of space, yes, they will have, they will have fights. But it will be fights like the Plains Indians had fights. It would be about revenge and prestige. It's not about land. Okay? If you have a particularly big bloody battle with your neighbor, what do you do? You pick up and you move. Okay? And that works great as long as there's spare land. What happens as the populations grow and the land, fertile land, fills up, the nature of war changes. And this is actually known to happen. So at first, you have another one of these bloody conflicts and this guy just wipes that guy out. Okay. Eventually, some very clever warlord figures out, instead of wiping him out, I'm going to subjugate him. I'm going to enslave him. I'm going to make him pay a tribute called taxes later on. And I'm going to use those taxes to hire my best war, uh, warlords and put them up as the administrative bodies over these slaves or subjugated peoples. Right? And what am I going to do with those people? I'm going to use them to build more roads and more fortresses and I'm Basically, I'm going to use them to build more and more and more and more empires. So you go from chiefdoms to kingdoms to empires in this ongoing, ever-expanding economic system that all works great, but it's fundamentally an oligarchy. It's, it's a hierarchy designed for the benefit of those who are on top, for the administrative classes, right? And in the end, just the king. This is... Um, the spiral dynamics version of evolution of consciousness. I'm not going to do their first couple of things because I like. But I'll start off with red. Okay. So this is, these are actually lovely color coded things. So I'm going to read to you because exactly that. This will help you understand why each one of these things reaches an end, essentially. So imagine that this is, you know, everything before this is the you know, from 5,000, uh, from 3,000 BC to here is all essentially power-driven exploitative empires. Just more and more and more, bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay, and let's think of this as Rome. Okay, Rome got really good at the empire building thing. And part of it was because they built all that great infrastructure. And they didn't treat <coughs> these subjugated peoples like slaves. They treated them like members of the empire. And so lots of them became more Roman than barbarian, okay? Unfortunately, they still had the oligarchic tendencies, 
So they still kept going farther and farther and farther. They had to have bigger and bigger militaries, and, and my sense of collapse is that what happens in almost all oligarchies is that you keep overextending, overenriching, greater corruption, and it, in the end it could happen from any number of ways. It could be an environmental catastrophe, it could be an economic catastrophe as it was in France, it could be, it could be diseases because when you're exploit, exploiting you will you know, there's not enough nourishment going down and the sewage builds up and the property grows and so there's all sorts of different reasons and which one it's going to be is kind of like a crapshoot. It could be global warming this time. <laughs> it could be the nuclear power plant in Fukushima which is about to spew forth huge amounts of radioactivity. It could be an economic collapse. It could be blah 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 blah. So it, the deal with this is the physicist. When when you get you get they get brittle basically. They've exploited so much, and everything is under such incredible stress that any one of these things could happen. And the real problem is that it is so incredibly fragile that you don't know where which next little bump is going to knock you off the cliff. All right. So red is wrong, but they went too far. They collapsed. There was a thousand years of dark ages, and what emerged was the medieval Catholic Church and the feudal system. And what were they? They were an order-maintaining institution. And they, they did a phenomenal job. And when you're thinking about the chaos that was after in the dark ages, it was a pretty good thing. But of course, the order-maintaining people went too far and they too started becoming exploitative and selling indulgences and ripping off the peasants and lavishly and having wars that they would fight each other, you know. It was a mess. Anyway, so we have the uh, Reformation Wars. And we actually have the Renaissance and the Scientific Revolution. And we end up with what is called the Orange Meme, which is the modern era. And now this is the success driven, this is strategic empires, this uh, enterprises. This is rags to riches, Horatio Alger, we're going to have these, you know, nice alpha <laughs> types who are going to, you know, build success from the grassroots up. We've done that for 1776 to now, 200 and some years. By the turn of the 20th century, we had the gigantic crisis of World War I, World War II, and the Great Depression, which was also the period in which all the great European empires collapsed. Turkey, Spain, Britain, okay? So this is at, in, in evolution of consciousness land, this is considered a, ch a major shift, right? Everything below here is still coercive hierarchies and, em and empire building, basically. It's just, you do it under a different guise, okay? What came out of this, especially in the 60s, is a new, they call it the green meme. You all will recognize the green meme, You've got, most of you are a part of it. It's the civil rights and women's rights, it's um, ecology, it's new age spirituality, it's all the stuff that we know and love. And it started in the 60s, and has done, made an astounding amount of change in the last 50 years. It's astounding when you think about it, yeah? Just quickly, where did the 30s fit in and where also a major transformation and... Yeah, the 30s are in, in, in all of this. But that's part of why that started. The 30s also part of creating a more egalitarian... Yes. Shared caring. Yes. yes. Caring community. The seed crystals of these things are always... Okay. And by the way, every everybody still contains all of these different stages of, old stages of consciousness are still there, you sort of build on top of them. So that your fundamentalist Christians are basically still in the order maintaining institution <coughs> stage of consciousness. And for them, faith in the authority system is what faith is about. Okay. Um, these guys, this is, this is, these are the neo, neoliberals von Berserko. You know, I'm rich. It must be because I'm a, an achiever and a job creator and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and, a and I did it all by myself. And I did it all by myself. <laughs> yeah.
<laughs> and so, I'm still trying to build an empire, <laughs> an economic empire, right? So you see these things all the time, and not a problem. All right. Now, green has gone about as far as it can go, because, okay, here are these things that are driving the change um, from green, which is overwhelmed by economic and emotional costs of caring, <laughs> also overwhelmed by the chaos and disorder caused by these guys. <laughs> um, let's see. Need for tangible results, results and functionality, knowing moves above feeling. Okay? So what's happening now is you're getting people like me, and you're getting people like Yes Magazine, <laughs> who every, every month or every week or whatever this cover just comes out, will give you new examples of positive futures, which are people all over the world reinventing their economies, reinventing their currencies, reinventing corporations. It's all happening, okay? But we're getting to the place where we're now getting into those practical details. Um, so you're getting, what is it? We're at this place of integration. Uh, practical issues, detailed understanding, and finding others who are doing this stuff so that we can band together and actually learn how to do it right. All right? So I think that's what's actually happening right now. So be careful with the, with the green stuff because people are overwhelmed by it, both the people who are doing it and the people who are out there responding into it because um, Robert Kennedy Jr. had this list of the top uh, 10 priorities for everyday people. And at this point, people believe that, they believe in environmentalism. They, most of them believe in global warming. They're probably against fracking, but they need jobs. <laughs> They need to feed their families. They need all those survival issues that somebody was talking about over there. So that if you push too hard on these, you're going to frustrate people, alienate people. You've got to go into these. You have to get into the practical solutions, realistic solutions, and doing positive functional things. Okay. Oh, if we're lucky, down the road, we're going to get this balance between all these different things and the synergy of all life forms and forces. Because that's where it's going. Actually, some of the people who do this energy stuff say that that's actually the first stage of civilization. We're just working our way up there. <laughs> yeah. Gandhi's uh, response to the, to the question, Mr. Oh, yeah. Gandhi, what do you think about Western civilization? I think it would be a good <laughs> idea. <laughs> so uh, this is back to the great integration of head, heart, power, spirit. So you now get why, for me, spirit and this idea that we are part of this, there is a higher power, that we're all part of it, it's innocent of us and more than us, that, I mean, I have faith now that there are millions of people all over the world in every different kind of field doing this stuff. It's really happening. We are forming this global brain. And we're all, yes, it's horrible because the death throes of every kind of oligarchy is horrible because they push harder on the very ways that are killing you. It's important not to get overwhelmed. It's also important to start learning the ways of power because it's not enough to sing kumbaya. It's not enough to have marches. <laughs> you have to figure out how to elect progressives to Congress. You need to help that happen. You need to figure out, you need to talk to your your uh, county commissioners and your city councils about how do we really make this, how do we start investing in our local economies so that we build jobs here that are going to stay here and we don't become dependent upon the big banks. So, right. so power and intelligence go in there, but in the final analysis it's what's going to attract people is the sense of I don't have to be afraid anymore. I really can belong to this place. There's a place for me. It's meaning making becomes a big deal in all of this kind of stuff. Um, if you want to get kids to learn, set them up with some kind of project that where they can mess around with reality, talk with their friends, 
meaning making works way better than sitting them down in little rolls and getting to try to memorize different facts. Okay. So getting the integration, the proper integration of all of these and realizing their necessity and start learning how to put them together so we can be effective in building this new, I mean, that's it. So um, do we have another one? I don't remember. Oh, yes. This is uh -huh. the end. <laughs> so if, if you get one of the flyers, this is on the back of it. So if you put all of the science together, this is what you get. You get, it comes what it believes, puts the messiness of learning above, the rig above rigid beliefs and procedures, <coughs> fosters creativity, openness, and critical thinking. Boy, do we need a lot of that. Needs a community to heart for unity and flow, emphasizes nurturing and development, balances challenge, discipline, and support. This is because, you know, we have three brains, the reptilian, the mammalian, and the, and the thinking, and each one of them, um, I learned this from educators, each one of them is always active, but different conditions bring different ones to the fore. So, guess what happens? Under threat, you move, shift out, downshift, they call it, into lizard brain mode. Mm -hmm. And what you do is you're in survivalist. So you basically are just trying to get out of this test, right? <laughs> and you can't learn, and you're just, you'll regurgitate whatever you can remember, and as soon as you're out of the test, you forget it all, okay? So the way to get kids to learn is not to put them in high-stress test situations, which is the absolute worst uh, learning mode. It's to create this supportive home between thinking and linking brains. You need support. And you need challenge. You need something interesting to do. They actually study brain uh, blood circulation in the brain and look at how uh, learning outcomes differ depending upon how much support and challenge you've got. Anyway, ex voids extremes of sweetness and fear and threat. You can't be too. You can't spoil people and just then you know talk down to them, condescend. And you can't constantly put them in any fear and threat. Roots and wings. Real healthy uh, communities have this balance between enough challenge that you're not, you know, that it's interesting, but not so much that you're like in fear for your life, that you're going to lose your job and everything's going to go down the tubes. Nor do they just, you know, spoil them, basically. So, uh, filters out cultural toxins. <laughs> Oh, dominator beliefs, eliminates deceit and manipulation, which is all over the media. Um, built of billions of specialists working together, values diversity and cultivates harmony, teaches cooperative skills because we actually have to learn that because we don't know how to do it very well anymore, and rewards pursuit that, pr pursuits that benefit self and uh, community. This is actually kind of important. It turns out if uh, sociologists who do a lot of research on what societies are happy and which ones aren't. There's actually this thing called the synergy gamut done by uh, an anthropologist named Ruth Benedict. And you can basically look at the rewards and punishments in a system, in society, for either acting solely for your own benefit, low synergy, or everything you do is benefits yourself and the community. Right? High synergy. And it turns out that if you have a high synergy, high synergy um, societies have virtually no homicide or suicide or drug abuse. Um, <laughs> basically, people are happy and healthy because everything they're doing is good for them and for the community so that they're comfortable together, they're happy together. <clears throat> and on the opposite extreme, when you have a society that rewards doing what's best for yourself regardless of the harm to everything or anybody else, what do you get? You get the modern world. You get, oh, we're going to do fracking and destroy your, everybody's afraid, everybody's, you know, people are falling through the cracks all over the place, so they get angry, they get violent, and you get murder, and you get violence, and you get everything else. So, making arrangements for rewarding things that benefit self and community is really, really, really important. You can even see it in the complementary currencies. Needs intelligence and empowerment spread from head to toe. They found this out when they started doing artificial intelligence. You can't get this, these robots to run from the top central processor down. You have little processor down at all the little feet so that they adjust. Right? That's the way you get it. So real systems need, these are all intelligent cells. They're all organized into intelligent 
systems in a certain sense. And you need to empower that, not wait for things to go up to the top of the bottom. Needs fractal connectivity, maintains a healthy, robust economic <laughs> metabolism that nourishes every fiber. This business of gaps between the haves and have-nots, that is the classic sign of what, you're, what, what drives revol uh, revolutions. It's not absolute levels of poverty. It's you sitting there with one thing, while somebody else is sitting there with something ludicrously more wealth when they didn't earn it. It's essentially the injustice factor. Watch out for revolutions. Anyway, um, develops guardian leaders, and this is part of the power business. We really do need leaders who are going to protect us. You know, if the guys we sent to Washington, we want them to protect us against enemies, foreign and domestic. Right? Um, so, avoid concentrations of power. Keep feedback loops across levels. So, I think that's it. Questions, thoughts, comments.